All right, so it's, it's four o'clock, so we will get started. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce Maggie Penn today um, to give the, this year's Banks McKelvey Memorial Lecture. Um, Maggie, you know, got her BA at UC Berkeley um, in 1999, and then she came here um, and got her master's um, and PhD and got the PhD in 2003. I had the honor of being on her committee. She's been uh, on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon, Harvard, WashU, the University of Chicago, and since 2018, she's been on the faculty at Emory. Now, some of you were here when uh, Jeff Banks and Dick McKelvey were here. Some of you know Jeff and Dick, or knew them. They were uh, really exceptional scholars, and, and they really made some important and lasting contributions in, in many academic fields. Um, but, you know, more importantly to me, they were great colleagues, they were great mentors, um, great scholars, and just great people. Um, they mentored and guided me, for example, and, and I'll forever be grateful to both of them for that, and they've mentored and guided countless others. Jonathan Katz, who couldn't be here today, he and I were tasked with trying to find this year's lecturer. And when we thought about who we should invite this year, the, the first person and the last person that we thought of, the only person that we thought of, was Maggie. Um, like Jeff and, and, and Dick, she's really making some important contributions in lots of fields, and it's very early in her career, and so you know, there are going to be lots of contributions um, coming. Um, she's well known as a great colleague and a great mentor, um, especially to, to many, many students um, who I've talked to. And she's also just a fantastic person. She was truly a fun graduate student to have here at Caltech and has been fun as a colleague to, to see her um, move through the profession and, and, and build into the important scholar that she's become. So please join me in welcoming Maggie. Maggie's going to talk about algorithms, incentives, and democracy. Thanks, Mike. And, uh Thank you for the honor of being able to present in this seminar. So both Jeff and Richard were my teachers. Uh, the first, one of the first papers I published, which was part of my second year paper at Caltech, was on the Banks set. And Richard was my, my dissertation advisor. And there's probably no one that has had a bigger influence on me sort of intellectually and just in terms of the philosophy he had uh, than Richard. John and I dedicated our first book to him. So he was a very important person to me. And uh, I'm so happy to be here to be able to, to present my work to you in, in their honor. Uh, so this is recent work with John Patty, who's in the audience, also a Caltech uh, PhD. And in this work, we're looking at classification algorithms, so specifically binary classification algorithms. So these are algorithms that are increasingly ubiquitous in our lives, um, and they're being used to make decisions that can affect people at a very profound level. So some examples are screening loan applications. So the binary aspect of this algorithm, is the applicant credit worthy or not? Or informing parole and bail decisions. Is this defendant at high risk of recidivism? Okay, so there are many different ap applications of these types of algorithms. Uh, they're being used all the time. So classification algorithms don't just sort people into categories such as credit worthiness or non-credit worthiness, they also change people's behavior. And oftentimes these algorithms are being designed explicitly to do that. So for example, we can uh, think of a fraud prediction algorithm, and the goal of this algorithm may also to be to deter fraud, so to change people's fraud behavior. Or a crime prediction algorithm that affects police deployment um, in an effort to reduce crime. So sometimes uh, this can be done deliberately, such as in these examples. But oftentimes, it can also be the case, or I don't know oftentimes, but it can also be the case that these algorithms change behavior inadvertently. Um, so we can think of an algorithm that evaluates college readiness. And incidentally, it may also promote college readiness in a population of students. So this kind of behavioral feedback is at the heart of formal modeling in the social sciences. It's something that we've been doing in economics and political science for, for 50 years. But it's just recently making its way into the machine learning literature. Uh, over the last decade or so. So what got us started on this project uh, was thinking about the city of Ferguson uh, after the Michael Brown shooting 
So uh, we were thinking about cities that issue fines on their citizens in a, in a predatory sort of way in order to raise revenue for the city. So as an example, think of two cities, and I'll, I'll return to this, this sort of thought experiment later in the talk. So one city is issuing tickets to maximize operating revenue, the other is issuing them to maximize public safety. And it might be the case that the residents of these cities are identical in terms of their underlying propensity to drive uh, safely. So these cities might look the same in terms of street infrastructure or commute times, fast cars, all the things that might, might drive uh, unsafe or safe driving. But in equilibrium, because of the way that people are being classified and because of the incentives that the, the ticketing algorithm is giving people, driving ticketing and public safety might look very different in these two cities because people respond to how they're being classified by this algorithm, the algorithm wants them to respond. So for some of these reasons, the use of classification, and many other reasons too, uh, the use of classification data has been facing a great deal of scrutiny and has been the object of democratic reform in some cities. And these regulations oftentimes focus on changing the stakes of certain algorithmic classifications. So an, exam an example is uh, the prohibition of credit scores in some cities uh, to determine uh, housing eligibility. So by prohibiting the use of this classification data, uh, it reduces the stakes of the credit worthiness classification, right? Or we could think about the elimination of cash bail as reducing the stakes of a, a high re release risk score. So what we do in this project is, is uh, this is a formal, a formal model, a game theoretic model. We use a very simple binary classification algorithm to consider a few questions that are kind of like fundamentally social science kinds of questions. So the first is, how do the objectives of the designer of an algorithm, so these two cities, for example, how do their objectives affect the distribution of behavior in a population in equilibrium? Um, the second, and then the second part of today's talk is what happens when the rewards and punishments to classification are democratized by the people being classified? So what if the stakes of the algorithm are the product of, of democratic reform? What do people want, and how does that affect what an algorithm designer can accomplish? And then finally, and I think I'll hopefully I'll have time to get to this at the end of today's talk, in a companion paper, what, we, what, what we're sort of setting this problem up to do is to think about how to think about algorithmic fairness in settings where algorithms and behavior are independent. So to move away from statistical notions of algorithmic fairness and think more about welfare notions of the consequences of these algorithms. Okay, so I'll give a, a brief literature review because this is a short talk, but uh, there's uh, a large and very cool literature on algorithmic fairness. Uh, part of this is sort of an impossibility result that tells us that we can't simultaneously satisfy different statistical fairness notions. And in the machine learning, learning literature, what we're the, the closest to is a literature on strategic classification. And so this is a literature that uh, tries to learn a classifier to maximize accuracy with the knowing that the data are endogenous to the classifier. So people might be trying to manipulate how they're classified, they might be lying about some data, or they might be changing their behavior in some way that the algorithm is trying to, to determine, okay? And, and then finally, probably closest to us, is uh, a literature on the fairness of equilibria in algorithm design. So uh, a paper, Fair Prediction with Endogenous Behavior, uh, has a result that we also generate in our model that I'll talk about a little later. And just a plug for a paper by me and John that I really like that came out recently that's also related to this project is this paper on banning the box, so removing felony status from job applications. And so what the, what the role is of that in a, a moral hazard context. And the fair prediction paper is in a, a policing context. So we think that the model today can kind of encompass a lot of these different types of contexts. Okay. So our contributions in this project relative to some of this related uh, literature is that we, we characterize what optimal algorithms look like for a general designer. So we can think about a predatory designer or an accuracy motivated designer or a, a compliance a maximizing designer, okay? And so this framework enables us to really see how the preferences of the designer shape societal outcomes. We micro found individual incentives in this paper, which some of those other papers do too, but what this framework does is it lets us think about the relationship between statistical and welfare-based notions of, of the fairness of a classifier. So think about, let's just think about things like envy-freeness, 
And then finally, we endogenize the rewards and penalties and really think about the relationship between algorithms and uh, the types of incentives that people have in order to be classified one way or another. OK, so I'll get to the model. This is a very simple model. So we have a unit mass of people and a binary set of behaviors that people can engage in, just zero or one. And this behavior represents something that each person uh, makes a choice about whether to do this and is going to be potentially rewarded on the basis of. So they're going to be classified on the basis of this behavior that they undertake. And then there's an algorithm designer who designs a classification algorithm. This designer is going to observe a noisy signal of the behavior that each person undertook and classify each, th each person as a zero or a one based on the signal that they see. And if the person is classified as a one, that will represent that person receiving a reward. And the reward could potentially be negative, so it could be the case that you're, you receive a penalty. So the way that we're thinking of an algorithm is, is, is as um, consisting of two parts. So the first is something that's an exogenous in this model, and we call this just the testing precision. How noisy is the data that the designer has about each person, what each person has done? So this precision is phi, and it's the probability that the signal that the designer sees equals the behavior that the person engaged in. And we always assume that this is greater than a half, but it might, be, it might be one. So it might be the case that the designer can perfectly see what each person did. And I'll talk about that a little later. So that's exogenous to the model. And endogenous to the model, what the designer is doing is, is choosing a classifier. And this classifier has two parts, delta one, delta naught. And delta sub signal is the probability that the decision of the designer, his classification choice, equals the signal conditional on the designer having observed that signal, OK? So delta naught is the probability a signal of 0 is translated into a 0. Delta 1 is the probability a 1 is translated into a 1. So just to make sure everybody is like on the same page, because we're going to use a lot of these deltas throughout the talk, 1-1 uh, one, one would mean that everybody is classified according to their signal. And 0-0 zero, zero would mean that everybody is classified the opposite of their signal. And a delta 1, delta naught of 0, 1 means that everyone is classified as a 0. So if I see a 1, I classify them as a 0. If I see a 0, I classify them as a 0. Okay, so those are just some examples, but these are probabilities. So people receive a reward if they're classified as a 1 and 0 otherwise. And all this reward represents is just their uh, benefit, just the difference between what they get if they're classified as a 1 versus a 0. So the fact that it's R0, it could be 2R and R or whatever. It's just the, the difference between being classified as a 1 and a 0. And the designer doesn't pay for this reward, and the designer doesn't profit from it. So we'll talk more about this in a bit. People choose a costly behavior, and we're going to call this compliance. Okay, So they choose to comply or not. And in order to comply, each person pays a cost, gamma. That's their own cost. And we're going to assume that those costs are distribu uh, distributed according to a, a log concave PDF that has full support. So this full support assumption is just there so that we don't have boundary conditions on the problem. But what it's going to mean is that there's always a positive proportion of compliers and non-compliers, regardless of any incentives people could have. Because if I have a negative cost, it means that I actually want to comply. And some people are going to have costs you know, arbitrarily negative. So there's no way to induce them to not comply. And some people are going to have costs that are arbitrarily positive, And uh, no one can induce them to, to comply. OK. So the timing of the decisions, people privately observe their costs. The designer publicly commits to a classifier. People make their compliance decisions. They're classified according to this algorithm. And then payoffs happen, which I haven't described yet for you. And I'll say, please stop me at any point in the talk if you have a question about the model. Or Yeah, Rod? When the designer publicly commits to the people what he's going to do. Yeah. He's, everybody knows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what this classifier is. Everybody knows what this classifier is. So this could be like, I'm going through the same traffic light. There's a traffic camera on it. I know that that's a totally accurate traffic camera. And so I'm going to get classified as a, a zero if I speed or something. Yes. It's a big assumption. Because 
Uh -huh. But people from out of town didn't know that. And that's, the, that's what they took advantage of, people not knowing that it was a street crime. So. so in this case, we are assuming that that's not the way they take advantage. They take advantage other ways. OK. okay. So the designer's payoffs uh, basically can be described by this confusion matrix. So we have sort of four outcomes for any given person. They engaged, they complied, they were assigned a one, they complied, they were assigned a zero, and so on. And the designer cares about the fraction of people that fall into each cell of, the, of this confusion matrix. So A1 is the designer's payoff for a person that falls into cell one. B, A1, B0 is his, his payoff for these two positives, and so on. And so I'll, I'll give you some examples of specific payoffs that could be described in this way that are sort of natural. OK, so people's incentives of whether to comply or not, people are going to comply if their expected payoff of complying is greater than their expected payoff of not complying. So if they comply, they pay this negative gamma cost, but there's some probability they're assigned a 1. And if they don't, there's some probability they're also assigned a 1, OK, depending on the noise of the algorithm. And so compliance is going to occur when people's costs are sufficiently small. It's just a, a simple expression. So conditional on a classifier, we're going to have an equilibrium fraction of people that are going to comply in this world, OK? And that equilibrium fraction is the, the CDF evaluated with, you know, with an argument of the right side of this inequality. It's just the fraction of people whose costs are less than R times that expression, OK? And so some examples of these costs could be like college readiness. Everybody has a private college readiness cost to becoming college ready. It could be how rich my family is, the quality of my schooling, and so on. So we have our equilibrium compliance term, which we're calling pi, just the fraction of people for a given classifier that choose to comply. And this rho term, which is r times rho, is the argument of the CDF, we're terming that the expected responsiveness of the algorithm to the signal. And what Rho tells us is the chance that if I see a, a signal of 1, I assign that person a 1. OK, so when Rho is positive, the classifier is incentivizing people to comply. Because it, if I comply, I'm more likely to get a 1 than if I don't comply. And when Rho is negative, the classifier is disincentivizing people to comply. Because if I comply, I'm more likely to be assigned a 0 than I am if I don't comply. OK? And finally, when this row term is 0, classification is totally independent of the signal. And we're going to call this a null classifier. So when this term is 0, it means that delta 1 plus delta naught equals 1, which means that the probability I'm assigned a 1 if I send a signal of 1 is the probability I'm assigned a 1 if I send a signal of 0. Okay, So there's no incentive for anybody to try to comply in order to, to experience a higher chance of classification some way or another. And so for any null classifier, the equilibrium fraction of compliers is just f of 0, where f is our CDF of the cost distribution. Okay. okay, so what is this algorithm doing? It's determining the distribution of outcomes in this confusion matrix. So it's incentivizing behavior. It's telling us how likely we are that a person is going to be in each of these rows. But it's also classifying the behavior. And optimally, it's trying to do that in a way that is most advantageous for the designer. So this is the designer's problem. And I just wrote it out this way to make the point that what makes the problem interesting is the fact that the classifier affects behavior, the fact that we have this pi term in the designer's expected payoff function. Because if behavior were not affected by the classifier, then the designer's payoff would be linear in the classifier. And the designer would always just want to choose something on the corner, a 0, 0, or a 0, 1, or something like that. OK. And so, and so the, the designer is choosing an algorithm, choosing a delta 1, delta naught, to optimally generate behavior and bin signals of that behavior into the cells of the matrix that are the most advantageous. OK, so here's some examples of cells of the matrix that, of uh, designer payoffs that are kind of natural. So this would be a designer that's maximizing accuracy. So all this designer wants to do is, is get the decision right, is to accurately classify behavior with this decision. Okay. So we could think about this as being like an epistemic judgment, a legal ruling of some sort. 
This type of designer only cares about trying to induce compliance. So he doesn't care how people are classified, but he cares about the number of people that choose the beta equals one activity. And so this would be a, a designer that's interested in maximizing public safety, deterring fraud. Okay, this designer only cares about behavior. This could be a predatory designer. So we lived in Chicago. There were predatory towers who were really interested, at, kind of like what you were just going about, interested in getting people to do the wrong thing and like tow your car. So this could be a designer that just wants people to fall into this lower cell of not complying and getting ticketed. And then finally, this is kind of a natural setting for a moral hazard type of problem. So we could think about an employment um, situation or college admissions. We have our designer. They want to admit the qualified student. They're worst off if they admit an unqualified student. And they kind of get something in between if they don't admit the student. Okay. So the point of these examples is that we think that the framework can kind of capture a, a pretty wide variety of different types of designer preferences. Um, and capture a lot of different problems that we think are interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some partial characterizations of what optimal classifiers look like. So the first is that if we drive rewards to infinity, um, if these rewards are sufficiently large, the designer can channel every person into any cell of the confusion matrix. So if the designer loves these false negatives, loves getting people to work but not paying them for it, with a sufficiently high reward, the designer can get 100% of the population to fall into that cell. And so this is why we're not letting the designer choose the rewards. It's not an interesting problem. He can always do his best by driving that reward up. Any optimal classifier is gonna require one of those two delta terms to be either zero or one. So we're always on the edge of our classifier space. But when the other classifier is in between zero or one, what that represents is an effort by the designer to stimulate behavior in the population by optimally classifying. Because if the designer were always classifying people optimally, conditional on this signal, he would always classify, uh, with he would always choose a classifier that's in this set, always choose something on the corner. But when he chooses something in, you know, that's probabilistic, he is committing, sorry, committing to optimally misclassify in order to drive behavior that's beneficial for himself. It's gonna look like a violation of sequential rationality, but it's not because he's committing to it before the, at the start of the game. If the designer wants to maximize or minimize compliance, we have a very simple classifier. So the designer is always gonna choose either one, one or zero, zero in a setting where the designer just cares about incentivizing behavior. Okay, finally, in the general case, it's always gonna be the case, and we have to, for our results, we assume a partial ordering on the cells of the matrix that I'll talk about on the next slide, but it's always gonna be the case that the problem is strictly quasi-concave in one of these deltas and quasi-convex in the other, okay? So what it means is that we're, it's always gonna be the case that one of these is zero or one, and the other is unique and interior, or vice versa. And to know which world we're in, all we need to do is know the sign of the reward. So just from a technical perspective, this simplifies our problem a ton because it turns our problem into a one-dimensional optimization problem. And so we use this a lot. And that ordering on the cells of the matrix that we need in order to get that is that A1 is bigger than A0 weekly and B1 is greater than or equal to B0. And there's other orders we could do too, but this is the natural one that we use throughout the paper. So we always prefer true positives to false negatives weekly and true negatives to false positives. And we think this makes sense. And all of the vignettes that I presented, the predatory, the maximum you know, accuracy, all satisfy this condition. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through a few examples of optimal classifiers and then we're gonna endogenize the, the penalties to classification. So hopefully people can see a little bit of what I've put up here. So this is an example of optimal ticketing in two cities. So suppose we have a reward of two for this example, and suppose that our signal is totally accurate. So we have like a traffic camera, it's completely precise. The designer can totally see who's, who's speeding. And let's suppose that individual costs to safe driving are just distributed normal uh, with a mean of zero, zero, one, okay? 
So we have a designer that's in an accuracy-motivated city, an accuracy-motivated designer that has a 1-1 one, one on the, uh, the off-diagonals. And then we have a, a designer that's a little more revenue-motivated. So this designer gets a 1 for true negatives and like a 0.55 for true positives. Okay. Optimal ticketing in our city that's accuracy motivated is going to be 1-1. One, one. Obviously, we have a totally accurate signal, so the designer is always going to follow that signal and is going to create a totally accurate decision 100% of the time. And that classifier is also going to maximize, it happens to maximize compliance. So we have 98% of people are complying and driving safely. But in the revenue city, the optimal classifier is 1.8. And so what that means is that the designer doesn't ticket any safe drivers, but also doesn't ticket 20% of the speeders, okay? And so obviously, this shouldn't be a surprising example to anybody, but it's just sort of illustrating our model and what, what we're producing. So this makes speeding more desirable by, because we're not ticketing all the speeders, and it increases speeding, and so it increases tickets for the designer. And we, we lower compliance, so now 94% of the people drive safely. The second example I wanted to present was something that was kind of thought-provoking to us, given the literature on algorithmic fairness. And this is an illustration of the fact that maximizing accuracy is not kind of a neutral goal, even though we often think of it as a neutral goal, okay? So let's think about an accuracy-motivated designer. Now let's let the reward be pretty high, 10, and the signal accuracy is kind of noisy. So the designer only can see what people actually did correctly 75% of the time. Okay, and again, we have these normal costs. If the classifier just followed the signal, we would have almost 100% compliance. Okay, so everybody basically would choose to comply. But the designer is only going to accurately classify three quarters of them, right? Because if he follows the signal, he's only as accurate as the signal is. So 25% of the people are classified wrong, okay? But if the designer decided to classify everybody as a one, since everybody is a one, compliance would disappear, and we would drop down to only being 50% accurate, okay? So the optimal classifier in this case, um, if we're interested in accuracy, is 1.37. So what this means is that 100% of the ones are classified as ones, and 63% of the zeros are classified as ones. So the designer is classifying a lot of people as ones. So this incentivizes less compliance than following the signal. So now we, the only 97% only of people choose beta equal one instead of 100. But it's correctly classifying 90% of the population. So it's doing a pretty good job of classifying by injecting that noise into the classifier. Now if the same designer faced a different population of people, now suppose this person is facing a population of people that's distributed uh, with a higher, a higher mean. Okay, so the mean is normal, the distribution is normal one, one. Our optimal classifier in this case is 0 0.92. So anybody sending a signal of one is classified as a zero, and 92% of the zeros are classified as zeros. So this optimal classifier is going to disincentivize compliance. So normally, if we just had a null class, if people weren't being classified, 16% of these people would have a negative cost and would naturally want to comply. But under this, under this classifier, only 8% are complying. And so this is, this is disincentivizing compliance, but it's just as accurate as the other, as the other classifier. It's correctly classifying 90% of the population. Okay, so we have our two populations. And the picture on the left is what people would naturally want to do, and the picture on the right is what the classifier induces them to do in its pursuit of accuracy. And so in our, in our low-cost city, the complier is inducing people to comply. In our high-cost city, the, the classifier is inducing people to not comply. Okay. And we think that this is an important kind of philosophical point about accuracy. So we often think of accuracy motivations as fair motivations, neutral motivations. And the algorithmic fairness literature focuses largely on error rates across group of classification. But here, both of our groups are being classified almost identical percentages of the time, OK? But the algorithm is incentivizing totally different behavior for people. And if compliance is a social good, 
this algorithm in its pursuit of accuracy is hurting people. And so what the end of this talk is, will be on if there's, if there's time for me to get to it, is this uh, companion paper that John and I are working on, which makes the point that the effect of classification on equilibrium behavior should also be an object of our fairness considerations and not just the errors in classification. So moving on to the second half of the talk, uh, thinking about what can we do about algorithms that are potentially uh, manipulating behavior in a way that's painful to people. So when the stakes of classification are high enough, the designer can induce almost 100% of people to, be, to comply or not comply. And oftentimes, the designer is going to want to induce that kind of identical behavior in people because it makes his classification problem easier. But obviously, some level of aggregate compliance is beneficial to a society in a lot of different types of environments, driving, you know, so on. And so the question we're asking now is, if the stakes of classification are the product of democratic reform, what does optimal classification and what does optimal compliance look like once we endogenize that reward that people face? OK, so previously, our designer was committing to a classifier. People were choosing their behavior, and signals were sent. OK, and then classification happened, payoffs were received, and so our reward was exogenous. Now we're going to change the first step in this problem. So people are going to vote on a reward in response to the designer's choice of classifier. The designer can choose the classifier in response to that reward. What we're looking for is a fixed point in the reward classifier space. So the timing doesn't matter. What we're looking for is an optimal classifier that induces the median voter to choose an optimal reward. And that reward induces that same classifier from the designer. So we're looking for a stable kind of classifier reward pair. Okay. So we have to put a, a restriction on what these rewards can look like, because if people were like totally unconstrained in rewards, then people would want rewards of infinity, and everyone would comply and be able to get this reward, potentially. So what we're going to assume is a budget balance condition on these rewards. Um, sort of similar to what we might see in a predatory city, where the fees that people are paying is financing the city. So voters are going to receive a reward if they're classified as a one, and that reward is going to be financed by a tax that's borne by each voter of the size of the reward times the average, uh, the expected number of people that are rewarded. So what this means is that if people are classified as a one, they get R times one minus the expected number of people that are rewarded. If they're classified as a zero, they pay R times that expected number. Okay, and so this gives us budget balance. All the people that are paying a penalty, that penalty is distributed to the people that are classified as a one. We're going to add one more thing to this model that is not necessary. We just thought it was interesting. So we're going to assume that voters also share preferences over aggregate behavior. OK, and so in every person's payoff function is an externality, a term that reflects aggregate compliance. So people each receive for some parameter t that we're assuming is weakly positive, doesn't, could be 0. They're receiving t times the aggregate compliance. OK, so people might, might want safe driving in their city. And so then we want to find what each voter's optimal reward is. And the only thing I'm going to mention about this optimization problem is that the voters' payoff functions are defined piecewise, because they're going to, every voter is going to face a reward cutoff below which they will not comply and above which they will comply. Okay, so that's why the payoff function is def defined in these two chunks for each person. Okay. So if we have a classifier that's not null, then we show that conditional on the behavior a person takes, voters' payoffs are single peaked in rewards and maximized at an interior reward. So there is a well-defined solution to this problem. If we have a null classifier, then payoffs are flat in the reward. Everybody is being classified exactly with the same probability each way, and so everybody is receiving the same payoff. And so by budget balance, everybody is receiving zero. So what these voters are essentially voting on is whether they optimally prefer to be a complier with one ideal reward or a non-complier with a, a different ideal reward that I will define for you in a sec. Okay. 
So what do these optimal rewards look like? The optimal rewards for people are of this form that I put up here. And you'll see that the optimal rewards are defined implicitly. And what they do is they set the virtual value of the sort of expected voter equal to t. And so what this means is that when a voter is choosing their optimal reward, they are making the same calculation as a profit maximizing firm that's choosing a price, okay? So it's a very similar, it's an identical kind of uh, cost benefit analysis that voters are making. So I want a higher price, I want a higher reward, but the bigger I make that reward, the more people are gonna engage in this behavior, and so the more I'm gonna have to pay them off, okay? So like the higher the price the firm sets, the fewer people buy the good, right? And that's, I did, we, were, we weren't expecting this actually when we set the problem up, but, but that is the problem that voters are facing. So for prospective compliers, the optimal reward is this term up there. For non-compliers, it's R0. And the only point to make about these two rewards is that they're identical for every person, OK? So there are only two possible ideal points that any person could have, and they're identical. OK. So what that means is that we have uh, half the people have the same optimal level of reward, or over half the people. Um, and so we have a say winning reward. There is a democratic equilibrium to the optimal reward. Okay. Um, and the next thing to note is that optimal rewards are going to generate a fixed fraction of compliance. So if a classifier is not null, it could be a predatory person, it could be a accuracy maximizing person or a compliance maximizing person. For any non-null classifier, compliance is independent of the classifier and equals exactly the number of people that the median voter wants to comply, this f of k star term. So what this means is that by taking a vote over these rewards, the voters can completely neutralize the algorithm. And they neutralize the ability of the designer to affect behavior. The only two behaviors that are possible in this model are either the level of compliance that's f of k star, which is exactly what the median voter wants, or f of zero, which we could get if the designer is just like, I'm, I'm choosing a null classifier. I'm classifying everybody the same way. So there's no incentives to classification. OK. So as I said a second ago, there's a Condorcet winning reward. It's the one that's preferred by the median voter of the cost distribution. And if we assume that the distribution of costs are symmetric about mu, then we have a pretty natural cut point in whether we're going to see a high reward or a low reward, whether the median is a complier or a non-complier. So if the costs of the median voter are less than t, where t is that parameter on the externality in people's payoffs to compliance, then the median is going to prefer the high reward and to comply. And if the cost of the median voter is below t, the median is going to prefer a low reward and to not comply. So T is the cut point in costs at which uh, the democratically chosen reward is sort of determined when we have a symmetric distribution of costs. Okay. And then finally, social welfare in this model, if we want to maximize Benthamite social welfare, the optimal reward is T over that responsiveness term. Okay. And this shouldn't be like a shocker to anybody uh, that democratically chosen rewards are always inconsistent with social welfare maximization. So the socially optimal reward is lower than what a compliant voter wants, with that, wanting that high reward because he's complying, but it's higher than what a non-compliant voter wants. So that socially optimal reward is in between. And the reason, it's, and the reason why it's, uh, democratic rewards aren't social welfare maximizing is that the voters are kind of um, preying on each other a little bit. Right, so I'm choosing a reward that en enables me to kind of profit off my fellow citizens that get a bad classification. Okay, so now we'll talk about what equilibria look like in the model uh, a little bit. So as I had said earlier, the way that we're defining equilibria is as a fixed point. So the voter is choosing a reward that maximizes his payoff conditional on the classifier 
and the classifier is chosen to maximize the designer's payoff conditional on that reward. Okay. So there can be zero, one, two, or three equilibria to this model. But I'll tell you when we're, we, we have, we can guarantee, uh, some cases in which we can guarantee equilibria. Um, so if we have multiple equilibria, they're always Pareto ranked for the designer and the, the median voter. And it's pretty easy to calculate which one makes them best off. Um, but there's a reason, and, and so if we have three equilibria, for example, or, or two equilibria, so we, could, we can potentially have a null equilibrium where the voter just chooses a reward of zero and the designer chooses a null classifier. Or we can have an equilibrium with a, a positive reward and a positively responsive algorithm or a negative reward and a negatively responsive algorithm. Okay, so there's sort of a dual to the problem. Like I can give a high reward to compliers or I can give a negative reward to non-compliers. And sometimes we can get both of those types of equilibria, but sometimes we can't. And the reason we have equilibrium non-existence in the problem is one reason is easy to get around. The space of rewards isn't compact. So if we bound the space of rewards, we would, we would get around this problem. But the trickier problem for us is that the designer's best response correspondence isn't convex valued. So the shape of the designer's payoff function is a saddle, and he always has two uh, local maxima. Okay. So when can we get equilibria? So this is kind of a messy expression just because the designer's payoff has that four terms in it. But we, we can always guarantee that there is a null equilibrium if f of zero, that's the fraction of people that would choose to comply condition, just naturally, conditional on a reward of zero, is not in this open interval, okay? And so what that means is that we need f of zero, like in an accuracy setting, f of zero can't be between one minus phi and phi. Um, but in different types of settings, it's different. So we need f of zero to not be too central in certain problems. So we can always guarantee a null equilibrium if either A1 equals A0 or B1 equals B0 or both of those conditions hold. So for example, if, if the designer is compliance maximizing or minimizing, we always have a null equilibrium, we always have equilibrium existence. If only one cell of the confusion matrix uh, gives the designer a positive payoff, we always have, uh, or a, a, any payoff, we always have, a, we always have equilibrium existence. And then finally, in what we think is kind of the most natural setting to think of, we're always going to have equilibrium existence if there's any noise in our signal uh, accuracy, and if f of zero is, for example, sufficiently small. And that's what that would say is that most people pay a positive cost to compliance, which is kind of a nat it's very natural in a lot of these problems to assume that everybody pays a strictly positive cost to compliance. So as long as as long as most people pay a sufficiently uh, a sufficient, a, a positive cost to compliance, we, we get equilibrium existence. Um, okay. So I'm going to give you an example of what equilibria look like um, in the model. So I'm returning to the optimal ticketing example. Um, so let's go back to this designer. There's two designers. One is accuracy motivated and one kind of prefers the true negatives to the true positives. And I, there's one more parameter that we need to define. Is, which is that externality to compliance. So for this case, we're going to just let it equal one. Okay, so people get uh, an additive term in their payoff function that's the fraction of compliers. And so in this particular example, both of these cities give us a unique equilibrium, and it's not a null equilibrium. Okay, so in their first city, people are going to democratically choose a reward of 1.51. We're going to get 100% accuracy. 93% compliance, and social welfare and the median's payoffs are in the table. In the revenue-motivated city, all the safe drivers are class don't get ticketed. 83% um, of the unsafe drivers do get ticketed. And the reward is higher now between it, the, the penalty to being ticketed. It's 1.82. And this gives us slightly lower accuracy but the thing to keep in mind about this example, the, reason, the thing I want to point out is that compliance, welfare, and the median's payoff are identical in these two cases. So we have a noisier classifier here and higher stakes to classification 
but the median is indifferent between everybody, every person in society is indifferent between these two classifiers, okay, by de democratizing the reward. So for any non-null classifier, the median wants to set a reward to give us exactly 93% compliance. That's just the, the solution to that optimal reward. And in order to get that level of compliance, when we have some noise in the classifier, we have to in work a little harder to induce people to comply. So we have a higher reward there. Okay. So oftentimes in this model, the only equilibria are null equilibria. So if, for example, we have a predatory designer and voters want compliance, they enjoy the externality of other people complying, for example, then a null equilibrium is going to exist, and it's going to be the only possible equilibrium. Okay. So when the median and the designer are irrevocably at odds with each other, any equilibrium is going to have to set the stakes of classification to zero. And so we're thinking of this as like a, a defund the classifier, like stop using it, okay. And, uh, and so this is a majoritarian desire to like neutralize the incentive effects of the algorithm. Okay. And then the final point that I will make about uh, this paper is just, it's just a simple point about democracy and efficiency. So the median is always trying to induce this fixed level of compliance that's his you know, profit maximizing level. If we have an accuracy motivated designer, for example, or I don't know, he could have any kind of preferences, the designer might be better off at that level of compliance classifying everybody as a zero, for example, okay? Or using a null classifier. But if we set the rewards to the problem exogenously, if we take the rewards away from society to induce artificially higher compliance than what the median wants, we can sometimes improve outcomes kind of across the board. So we can make the designer better off, the median better off, and aggregate social welfare better off by using uh, an ex a, a different reward than what the median wants because we can sometimes induce the designer to to start using that signal information in a way that's beneficial to people. Okay. Okay, so for the last 10 minutes of the talk, I'm gonna talk, uh, is there any questions? I feel like this, <laughs> like, I thought this was a very long talk, but I'm kind of uh, going through it pretty quickly, but okay, I'll continue. What is C? Uh, oh, oh, is C or fee? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I'm glad you asked that question. Like, so what's the effect of fee on this problem? So Yeah. So so just like the the median is indifferent over the classifier. The median is actually also indifferent over fee, as long as it's not a half, I mean, as long as it is slightly informative. And so what the median is just gonna do in that case is um, jack up the reward really high because, to, to, because the median needs to incentivize people for all that noisiness that people are facing. So the median is gonna, so if we have a very low accuracy signal, the median is just going to increase rewards in order to still get that same 93% compliance that we want. So in this case, fee is one, but we could also do this with fee of like 0.51, and we would still have the same compliance, welfare, and median payoff. Yeah. I know, I should have put that on the slide. I think it's kind of... Okay. So for this last part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about recent work, and John's been working on this today, so this is not as, uh, as finished as the other stuff, but uh, we're pretty excited about it. So this is... Um, thinking about classification and algorithmic fairness in these settings where behavior responds to the classifier. So the field of algorithmic fairness, and I know many of you are working in this field, so, but I'll describe it to those of you that aren't. Uh, this is how to think about procedures that classify diverse people, okay, and, and the fairness of these procedures. And most of these measures of fairness are statistical measures. So what, what they focus on is the predictive performance, like the accuracy of classification across different groups, oftentimes protected groups, men and women, for example, okay? 
And what this literature assumes is that more fair algorithms do a better job of equalizing some error metric across populations of people. And what that error metric is, is up for debate. And obviously, there's many different ways of thinking about errors in classification. So we could have, try to equalize false positive rates or um, many different types of rates that we could try to equalize. So the question that we've had for a long time with this, with this project, and this, I'll note that this is a big project for us. So this is a book project. There's gonna be a, there are already a number of different pieces to it. But um, one of the first things that we started thinking about in it was how, how we characterize algorithmic fairness when the behavior that we're trying to classify is sensitive to the algorithm. And we thought of a, a classic example in statistical discrimination from the 1970s. Okay, so this is just Erovian statistical discrimination in hiring. A classification algorithm is going to give an applicant a job or not, potentially on the basis of whether that person is qualified. And it's costly to become qualified for everybody. Suppose that this algorithm is sexist and it thinks that all women are unqualified, okay? Then rationally, no woman is, no, every woman knows they're not gonna get hired. No woman becomes qualified and the algorithm perfectly classifies every woman as unqualified. So by most measures of algorithmic fairness, this classifier's treatment of women is not problematic. This is a perfect classifier. It's totally accurate, okay? And so if we're thinking about accuracy as our measure of fairness, this is an example where something seems wrong. And so just to give you some preliminaries in this literature, so we're gonna think about two different groups of people that only differ in their members' cost distributions, distributions of becoming qualified or of complying. So now we're gonna have two CDFs, F1 and F2. And these groups might also d differ in their signal accuracy. So it might be easier for me to see whether people are qualified in one group than another. Okay, so they might also differ in fee one and fee two. So error rate balance says, and this is, these are well-known algorithmic fairness uh, properties. So error rate balance says conditional on behavior, we want this algorithm to be equally accurate for the two groups. Okay, so conditional on a person being qualified, this algorithm is making the same level of number of errors for men and women, okay, when we look at qualified people. Predictive parity says conditional on the designer's decision, the algorithm is equally accurate for these two groups. Okay, and so this is like conditional, when we look at the people that are hired, we want men and women to be equally qualified, okay? So these, these two notions are conditioning on different things. One is conditioning on the rows of our confusion matrix and one is conditioning on the columns of it. And a very well-known theorem in this literature tells us that it's impossible to simultaneously satisfy these two notions of fairness. And this was the big debate in the COMPASS recidivism prediction tool. It satisfied predictive parity, so this is used to, to determine um, recidivism risk for defendants, but it didn't satisfy error rate balance. And they found that more blacks were incorrectly classified as being high risk of recidivism than whites were, and more whites were incorrectly classified as being low risk of recidivism. Okay. So in this um, new project that John and I are looking at, we wanna think about fairness when the data are a function of the algorithm. And we think that these statistical notions of fairness are disconnected from welfare-based notions of fairness, which are so common in, in economics and in the social sciences. And so we're asking, are there connections to be drawn between these, these different types of fairness criteria? So who benefits or is harmed by the pursuit of fairness? And how do these notions of fairness relate to individual incentives? Like in our example of Erovian discrimination and the incentives of women to get qualified for a job. So we define two, uh, two notions that are a little different than what's being used in the literature. So we're not the first people to think about envy freeness in this classification context, but we are thinking of it in a different way than what we've seen in other literature. We're thinking of it at, at the individual level where people know their, their types, they know their own costs. So envy freeness would say, conditional on my costs or any person's costs, no one wishes to be in a different group, okay? So if my cost to qualification is X, I don't wish that I was a member of some other group that had that cost X. Okay, 
And equal opportunity, which we should probably call it something else because this is also sort of an overloaded term in this literature. But this says conditional on my cost, conditional on my type, behavioral choices are independent of group, okay? So for men and women, for example, who face some cost to becoming qualified for the job, the, the employer is using an algorithm to hire them that always induces a man and a woman with the same cost to do the same thing, okay, so that we don't have that, that uh, situation in, that seems so pathological. And a preview, a taste to come, <laughs> John was proving this this week, uh, for binary classification problems, and when preferences are group independent, what that means is that people have the same payoff functions, they don't depend on their group, which is obviously a strong assumption, but we can't have a situation where men want to be classified as a one and women want to be classified as a zero. So we're assuming people have the same, the same payoffs. The notion of envy freeness that I just presented is equivalent to equal opportunity and is equivalent to error rate balance. So satisfaction of one implies satisfaction of all of them, which provides a defense of error rate balance. It's a statistical notion, but there's also a welfare-based defense of it that, um, that we were sort of surprised by. But this is not to say that error rate balance is like the, necessarily the way to go. There are also different related defenses of predictive parity that we're also working on. And part of which one is a more natural notion of fairness depends on the, the, the kind of what we're using this classification data for. Okay. So to conclude the talk. Uh, so the designers of these algorithms have preferences over how people behave oftentimes and how they're classified. Um, and when the stakes of classification are exogenous, which they probably are in most cases, designers can manipulate the population of, um, of behaviors in a potentially dramatic way. And what we think is interesting is that manipulation might be intentional or not. But in any case, we're thinking of it as representing a structural basis of inequality. So we have people that are the same, but the way they are being judged by someone else is inducing them to become different and potentially unequal. Okay. Um, what our democracy points are is that when the, stakes of, when the stakes of classification are democratic, the designer's ability to manipulate behavior becomes quite limited. And the designer can only face a choice of manipulating the number of compliers between either f of zero, if he chooses the null classifier, or, or the level of, of uh, compliance that the median wants. Okay. And then this is my final slide, so some ongoing and future work. Um, so one thing that I didn't talk about in this talk is connecting these results on algorithmic fairness with the results on optimal classification that were like the whole first part of the talk. So one of the questions that we're interested in is, are there certain types of designers, certain designer preferences that optimally yield NV-free classification? And the answer to that is sometimes there are, there are certain types of designer preferences, that when those designers are making decisions for different groups, they are creating classifications of those groups that yield envy freeness across groups. Um, if we think about this same problem with respect to democratizing the stakes to classification, so if we fix our, our classifier and let people decide on the rewards, can those democratic rewards be consistent with envy free classification? And the answer to that is, in general, no, they can't. Because the optimal reward from the voters' perspectives is totally dependent on the distribution of costs. So if we have two groups with two distribu different distributions of costs, they're going to choose very different levels of, of penalties and rewards. And then finally, just some conceptual issues. There are a lot that we're working through in the book that we haven't solved that we're, we're still thinking about. So what does it mean to change groups from an envy-free perspective? Like, when I become male, do I inherit their, do I, do I keep my, uh, the noisiness of my signal, or do I inherit the male signal noisiness? So we're assuming you inherit it right now, but there are lots of different, it's not necessarily clear how we think about these types of fairness criteria. Um, obviously, the, our results on democracy, as Michael was saying, Preferences for noise and transparency are a really important issue. And what we've found is that voters are actually, given the setup we have, sort of totally indifferent over noise, even though all of these notions of algorithmic fairness are like so centered on noise. Um, so that's something that uh, we're working on. 
thinking more about. And then finally, what is classification used for? So is this classifier uh, meeting out the rewards, or is it used in some other sort of larger, uh, larger situation that the voter is involved in? Um, and so that's getting at our notions of predictive parity. But it's 5 o'clock. I think it's time for the happy hour. So <laughs> I could take some questions right now, but I can also just talk to you at the, uh, at the reception. <laughs>